Firstly, this is going to be a very rapid once over of an extraordinarily rich body of research. Um, over the past year I've had the what for me has been enormous pleasure of slowing down my work and diving much more deeply into the evidence base that exists around effective communication. Um, and many of you will relate to the fact that for you know, decades prior to that, I was often working under urgency to develop, produce, and get out into the world messages around complex social issues with often very little time to research or even test those messages before they went out. So um, I'm really, really aware of what a privilege it is that I have at the moment to slow down and dive deep. And I'm also really aware that in this room will be people who are sort of deep experts in various aspects of the, you know, this rich science of effective messaging. So um, I hope that in this fairly rapid once over, you find things that are immediately useful to you. Um, there may be things that just leave you with more questions, and if so, Jess and I would be keen to hear from you. So just very briefly, the purpose of the workshop is to reframe the conversation in Aotearoa, New Zealand, about complex social issues. And the reason we want to reframe the, com the conversation is because the way we talk about issues has a clear and measurable impact on how people think about issues. I mean, it seems obvious when you say it, but there are deeply embedded cultural stories in New Zealand that people use to explain complex social and environmental issues. And those stories have come about through the use of story. And the only way we can shift them, particularly if they are either um, misleading or overly simplified, or just flat out wrong, is by thinking really carefully and being really uh, disciplined and rigorous about the way we talk about these issues. Um, and so that's where, we've, that's where we've both sort of come to from different directions, um, and that's the work we're trying to do. So if I wanted to describe the problem that we're tackling at the workshop, it's that when experts, and in various ways we all communicate as experts, when experts talk about issues, they provide information. Oh, why is that coming through? I thought I'd turned it off. Sorry about that. Um, they provide information in the hope that people will better understand that issue. That information that we provide as experts doesn't arrive, as we all know, as communicators, into a void. Right? It arrives into a context in which people already hold beliefs about that issue. And some of those beliefs are really deeply embedded. And so an example that we often use is that in research that Jess and I participated in two years ago, we discovered something that will surprise nobody in this room, which is that one of the deeply embedded cultural narratives in New Zealand is that poor people are poor because they made bad choices. At some point along the way, they made bad choices. And there may be sympathy as to the fact that they, they themselves were poorly parented and that is why they are making bad choices. But there's a deeply embedded story. When you ask people in focus groups around New Zealand, why are poor people poor? They'll tell you it's because they've made bad choices. Now they also hold other beliefs, beliefs that are in some way contradictory to those. They hold beliefs about the fact that there are aspects of the environment, the economic environment, the cost of housing, the struggle to get well-paid jobs that are also contributing to people finding themselves living in low-resource houses. But one of those narratives is dominant currently. And currently the dominant narrative is the individual choice narrative when you, when you do this qualitative research. So when we talk as experts about child poverty, what our research showed is that what people hear is bad parents. And so this is the sort of the conundrum or the challenge. I'm just going to have to figure out how to turn this off. Sorry, I thought I turned it off. I don't think it's yours. Oh, it's not? Okay. All right. Well, maybe not. Um, is how do we change the way we talk about these complex social issues in order to actually shift those deeply embedded problematic cultural stories? And one of the <coughs> things that we know is that we can't shift them by giving people more or better factual information. Because the, what the brain is very, very, very good at doing is protecting its existing beliefs. So if we believe something, 
we, our brain will work very hard to protect and maintain that belief. And so if we present somebody with information that contradicts a deeply held belief, their impulse is to reject that information. And that will happen largely unconsciously. And their impulse to re reject that information will have an emotional response in them. And that will also happen largely unconsciously. So if we want to create the conditions into which to place our better, more truthful, more accurate information, we first have to deal with those pre-existing beliefs and emotional responses. And that is one of the ways that values-based messaging can be so powerful. So our passion is uh, to support more and more and more of the people working so hard in this country to create a better future for all New Zealanders, to use an evidence-led framework to communicate. And there are many aspects to that framework. These are only some of them. The messenger that we use, the language, including the metaphors that we choose, clarity about how, how our audience is, the values that we are embedding in and evoking through our messages, clarity about what our message actually is, which sounds obvious, but is really easy to forget. <coughs> And something that we call causal stories, or some people um, call them uh, mental models. And that's understanding how if the public or if a, a predominant section of the public hold a story about what causes a problem that is untrue, you cannot just re re sort of break one link in that story. If you do, the brain will very quickly work to repair that link. The only way that you can shift a causal story is by replacing it with a better, more compelling, complete causal story. So these are some of the things. What are we going to mostly focus on today? Uh, we're mostly going to focus on very briefly looking at audience and just one insight into audience that I've found super useful from the research. Very briefly looking at being clear about your message and we're going to spend most of our time on values. Throughout the course of the year, Jess and I will be doing all sorts of training opportunities and workshops and talks and blogs and about other aspects of this, so hopefully they'll be useful. So firstly on audience, look, you're all communications professionals, many of you are. We know that it's really important to be clear on who our target audience is. So just one insight from the research that I've found um, really useful to keep coming back to is that in any audience, even once we've sort of identified our, our demographic or target audience, um, you can often see within that target audience three sort of places along a spectrum that somebody might be. And this is a spectrum of that person's existing beliefs in relation to the issue that you're trying to communicate. So at one end of the spectrum is what I call the supporter base. These are people who already believe the uh, evidence-based story that you were trying to tell about the issue. They already believe it. I call them your base. They are important, not because you need to persuade them, but because they tend to be amplifiers of your message. So because they already believe what you're saying, they love to share your message with their friends and family. And here's the important thing. Their friends and family may be in the next group, which is your persuadables. And persuadables are people who hold more than one possibly contradictory belief about the issue that you are trying to communicate. And they can be switched or toggled from one of those beliefs to another. And so the job of effective messaging is to find a way to move your persuadable audience into the most helpful belief or causal story that they hold about your issue. Steadfast opponents are people who hold a deeply embedded belief that is contrary to the evidence-based story that you are trying to tell. And those beliefs are held very dearly because they protect people's values. Beliefs are ideas that we hold to because they protect our values. So it is really extremely difficult to shift uh, a kind of a steadfastly held embedded belief. And I don't think it's good use of our time as communicators and advocators and of our limited resources to try and shift steadfast opponents. 
One of the challenges as communicators is that steadfast opponents often take up a lot of space in public communications. Um, because they so strongly hold this opposing belief, they really want to engage and challenge the message that you're communicating. So it can be very hard to resist the desire to engage with them. But because they're so hard to shift, and because every time they repeat their message, persuadable people are hearing it, and potentially being persuaded by it, there's a very good strategic and tactical argument for not engaging with your steadfast opponents at all. Eventually, I'm not saying that give up on these people. My belief is that if enough persuadables in their circle of influence move to your base, some of those steadfast opponents will shift into your persuadables, but that is going to be affected by the beliefs of the people around them. And so I think this, both the tactical and smart strategic thing to do is to focus on your persuadables. So what I would say in audience is you need a message that resonates with your base. They need to be, they need to recognize in it the key values and ideas that they already agree with. But you need to ensure that it's one that when they repeat it, it will work for your persuadables. And so that's why um, I think there are lots of messages that work for people's base, uh, but it doesn't translate well to their persuadables. So we'll talk more about that as we go through examples. And the problem with that is that your base is really excited by that message, and so they start sharing it with everybody, and it has a really detrimental effect on your persuadable audience. And so this comes to the question of being clear about what it is that we want to say. And these are some um, just really massively oversimplified but quite still quite reliable findings from this is largely drawing from cognitive research. The first thing is be really really clear on the better world that will exist when the changes that you are advocating for or the programs or the initiatives that you are advocating for happen. So this is something that seems obvious but it's incredible how often we forget to do it. We start the story with the problem. And what Martin Luther King knew is that you've got to start the story with the better world. You have to evoke a vision that people can believe in about how the world could be better. And this is related to this, but it's slightly different. In your communications, you want to sell the cake, not list the ingredients. And so the cake is the better outcome. The cake is happy, healthy babies bonding in really you know, healthy ways with their parents. The ingredients is paid parental leave. And we spend a lot of our time as communicators, particularly in social policy areas, communicating about the ingredients. And the ingredients, we need to know what they are, and there's a time and place, obviously, to get really clear on those ingredients. But don't lead with the ingredients. Don't name your campaign after an ingredient, which is something that I've spent like decades of my career doing. <laughs> like basically naming the campaign by the policy change that we wanted to achieve, naming it a section of the Crimes Act. Um, you know, just, I look back and I think, what were we thinking? Um, the other thing that we've done a lot of, or I've done a lot of, is negating or myth busting. So engaging in the, those untruthful narratives in order to bust them. It's the sort of thing that we were doing when we were um, campaigning to increase the refugee quota in New Zealand, where we would say things like, um, 10 myths about refugees, and then we would provide the more truthful uh, version of that. And what cognitive science unfortunately tells us is that that only works with people who are already convinced. People who are already convinced that refugees are not terrorists uh, will engage with that message. Anybody persuadable, so that means people who think maybe refugees are just people like us who want to make a life in New Zealand, or maybe they're dangerous terrorists, by evoking the myth in order to supposedly negate it, I reinforce that myth in persuadable people. It's an extraordinarily frustrating quirk of the human brain that um, we don't remember necessarily where we got information from, but if we hear information that resonates in some way with an existing belief, and particularly if it evokes fear in us, uh, it unfortunately reinforces that. So one of my big learning curves in the last five years is just do not engage with untruthful, unhelpful narratives in order to try and negate them. Instead, 
tell the story that we want to tell. And so I just, before we go any further, I want to play a little video that came out this week um, as an example of where I think uh, an organisation is working really hard at doing these three things. Um, and I think they've done a pretty good job of it. We dream of a day in the future where all New Zealanders can stand on their own. We dream of a day where there is enough for everyone. Pathways are created for finding a dream, to strive, to flourish. Doors are open, futures bright. Father are the architects of their own destinies. Come on, you. We dream big. We dream of a day where our support is no longer needed. Father order. We believe in family. So I don't know, like just as a general sense, can you get a sense of how that left you feeling? And one of the questions that I now ask myself at the end of things, did that make me feel like change is possible? Or did that make me feel like the problems are overwhelming and inevitable? And for me personally, that made me feel like change is possible. Uh, it also made me feel like there are people who are agents of their own future, who need the systems around them to enable that, rather than needing rescuing by me. So I really, I just came out this week and I wanted to give the Whanau Water Commissioning Agency some props because I think that's a really beautiful piece of, um, of communication where they're clear on their message and they're telling their message. And there are so many myths, damaging myths in that space that they just don't engage in. Um, they just tell the story that they want to tell, which is that they're working with families with big dreams and that they have big dreams for those families. Mm, let's see, move on. So now to the sort of bulk of the message. And there are so many aspects to evidence-based messaging, but I would choose, if I had only a short amount of time, as I do today, I would choose to focus on value-based messaging. Because the evidence base is so strong for the difference that it can make to how people respond, particularly where we're looking to shift those deeply held um, mis leading stories. So when I use the word value here, I'm talking about the things that matter most to us. They are um, things that tend to transcend situations. So within an individual person, values are relatively static and we carry them. I'll talk a bit more later about the exceptions to that. Our values evoke emotions, and that is why as communicators we understand the importance of emotions, but in terms of how it's operating within a human brain, a lot of the power of emotion is that they connect to our values, and our values are really deeply uh, sort of interrelated with our beliefs. The other thing to be aware of as communicators, obviously, is that they operate largely subconsciously. So I'm going to talk about them today as though they're like these very sort of transparent things that we can, you know, engage with consciously and as communicators we can engage. But when they're happening to us and in us, it's often happening subconsciously. And that's why sometimes common sense doesn't guide us into quite the right direction. <coughs> Values matter as communicators because they lie at the heart of motivations. Our values tell us what matters most to us and that therefore affects the things that, uh, the objectives or goals that we have for ourselves, our communities, our countries, which in turn shapes our attitudes and our behaviours. So getting to the heart of values helps us get to the heart of the sort of what motivates people to act. So. This is a map that is drawn from the work of, um, well, I, I've been saying for the past year, this is drawn from the work of a researcher called Shalom Schwartz. Jess made the point yesterday, it's probably drawn from the work of many researchers, including many undergraduate women mm -hmm. who are not named in the report. Um, but Shalom Schwartz, who uh, is the lead researcher on this project, and he uh, instituted um, quite, I mean, an enormous project of um, measuring the values that people prioritise. And he did it across, um, I think, 18 different language groups and 60 different countries, quite a number of different cultural groups, and uh, 65,000 people. 
and that did include a cohort here in New Zealand. And what he discovered is that across all of those different groups, there are certain values that exist relatively universally that show up in almost all of these um, cultures. Of course, he's now given them names, um, which they may not be recognisable by these names. Uh, and I'll give you, uh, I'll tell you at the end of the day where you can find this, because this is a common, um, what do you call it, commons, under commons licence. This particular version of the map of values is created by an organisation called Common Cause, who've taken Schwartz's academic work and uh, I would say translated it into much more accessible forms for practitioners like us. But what's interesting about this map is that the placement of the values on this map uh, reflects the statistical relationship that each of those values had to each other. So what I mean by that is that um, if you look up in the top corner where equality, protecting the environment and unity with nature are sort of relatively close to each other, the closeness to each other means that a person who strongly prioritised equality was statistically more likely to also strongly prioritise protecting the environment. I mean, it's not that surprising when you look at the map. So likewise, a person who strongly prioritised accepting my position in life was more statistically more likely to also strongly prioritise moderation. And the inverse is true, the further away values are from each other, the less likely they were to be strongly prioritised in the same person. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you, and it's sort of, there's a common sense element to it, right? Like we do have a general sense that if you really strongly prioritise tradition and conformity, you are less likely to also strongly uh, prioritise hedonism and stimulation. Um, you know, that's a sort of, there's a common sense element to it. But what's also important to note is that this research found that most people value all of these things to some extent or another. The diversity is how much priority we give to one or another. Uh, and those prioritisations develop through a whole rich kind of diversity of behaviours and experiences in the early part of our life and they can change a little. But once we reach sort of adulthood, they do seem to be relatively static when they are measured through this PVQ tool, which is a tool designed to actually elucidate from people what their deepest priorities are, as opposed to what they think they should be. So when you measure a population group over time, the prioritisation of their values is relatively static. Unfortunately, what that doesn't mean is that people act in accordance with those values in a consistent way, um, but we'll come to that in a minute. This is another way of... Um, representing this map. It's a, it's an over, it's a simplified version and um, it helps because it helps me to think about um, the sort of quadrants of values that you see here. So the three in the sort of yellow-green quadrant, self-direction, universalism and benevolence, are what the researchers labelled intrinsic values. So values where the reward for what matters to us is a kind of an in, internal, it's, uh, it has its own reward. There's no value really, that, there's no reward we get for these behaviours outside of ourselves. And in the bottom corner, achievement and power, which has everything about sort of uh, ambition and social power and wealth, the researchers describe these as extrinsic values where the reward for valuing those things or for prioritising them tends to be external. It doesn't have to be material, but it tends to be, because in there is also... Um, sort of physical appearance and, you know, the valuing of um, power in the form of attractiveness. So very broadly, we have intrinsic values in the top and extrinsic. Those terms, Jess doesn't like them because she finds that she can never remember which one is which. Um, and I can see how they are confusing. Another way that um, the, the researchers labelled them is that the top quadrant are self-transcendence values, where you're transcending yourself and the bottom values are self-interest values. Um, I think it's like, the, I'm a little cautious about that term because we can think of self-interest as being bad. And I think it's really important not to think of any of these values as being bad. Um, they're all, most of us would probably, to some degree, you know, value all of them, just to different, give different priorities to them. Um, yeah, I think I'll move on from there. So, 
I'm going to read you two texts and uh, then I'm going to ask you to tell me which of these two texts you think would have converted more people to, well, the, at the end of this text, people were asked to either volunteer with or donate to the, this organisation's scope. So the question is, which of these two texts do you think would have converted more people to take action in support of the organisation's scope? The first text, Scope works with disabled people and their families at every stage of their lives. We believe that disabled people should have the same opportunities as everyone else, enabling them to live the lives they choose. Yet today, disabled people are more likely to live in poverty, more likely to experience negative attitudes or prejudice, and more likely to live alone. They still face marginalisation and discrimination. We help to address the barriers that cause disabled people to be treated unequally, support them in making decisions about what they want to do, and help them put those choices into practice. With the right reassurance and practical assistance, disabled people can live independent lives. Right, text two. Scope works with disabled people and their families at every stage of their lives. We believe in giving disabled people the chance to achieve greater success in their lives so that they can fully contribute to the economy. Yet today, disabled people are more likely to be unemployed and receiving benefits. We deliver a range of low-cost early interventions, helping to address these issues while delivering considerable cost savings for both disabled people and the state. Early intervention represents a great return on investment. For example, one initiative costs around £65,000 to set up. That's just £500 each for the 130 or so families that can be reached over the course of a year. So firstly, any thoughts on which values are being evoked in text A? Fairness, definitely. Fairness and unfairness. It's probably easier if I put this one up for you. Universalism. Universalism. <coughs> Benevolence. I think there's quite a strong self-direction value in here as well. There's quite a lot about people having, you know, making choices, um, live the lives they choose, making decisions about what they want to do. So I think they're trying to evoke, I would say the researchers, because this was for a research project, were trying to evoke universalism, benevolence, and self-direction. Uh, and in this one, <laughs> yeah, a, a lot about money, right? It's a lot about economy and cost, and a little bit about success, greater success, which would come into that kind of achievement. Yeah? Just a question. What was the objective of the text? So, Yeah, so at the end of this, there was uh, one group got given a will you volunteer ask, and one group got a will you donate to our work ask. So there's a group that got, so the, the way the experiment was structured, there was a group that got a control text. Well, actually, they got no text. They were just, will you donate to scope? Will you volunteer for scope? With no priming. Uh, one group got the intrinsic message, will you donate, will you volunteer? And one group got the extrinsic message, Will you donate? Will you volunteer? And so the question would be, um, who thinks that text A, the intrinsic values, produced um, more people being likely to volunteer or donate than the no priming at all? Yeah. So definitely more than no priming. Uh, who thinks that text B? got more than no priming at all. And if you had to choose between the two, which you think would have been more effective in getting volunteers and donations, who would pick the text A? The benevolence universalism? Yeah, and would anybody pick text B? Yeah. Anybody with other thoughts on what might, yeah? Sorry. <coughs> 
yeah. because it's like, and it's really, really hard for my values to like, um, to feel like, Yeah. Well, but the good news is text B is shit and produces That's terrible true. results. Okay. <laughs> but I wasn't going to tell you that just yet, but since it's disturbing you, and I get why it's disturbing, because it is offensive, but people have been told we need to use these offensive frames because they work. Right. And they don't. At least they don't work any better. In fact, they, they work less well than intrinsic framing that focuses on things like self-determination. So the evidence is pretty clear on this. And these, these studies have been replicated. And I was going to come, over, come to the um, actual results of that study in a bit, but I didn't want to leave you feeling like I was going to tell people to speak that way, because the whole point is really that we don't need to do that anymore. Anyway, you just want to say something. I, have, I can see what you mean by text, though, but I found some of that quite negative, the, yeah. the, the reframe that in a more positive way. Okay, so one of the things about value-based framing is it doesn't have to be all positive. We are allowed to name the barriers. We are allowed to speak truth to power. Values-based messaging doesn't mean you never call out the barriers that people face. Um, Values-based messaging means that there's a difference between saying, if we look at this, there's a difference between saying the problem is that disabled people are more likely to experience negative attitudes and prejudice, that's a very different problem to they're more likely to be unemployed and receiving benefits. So it's like those that you're evoking two very different values. And one you're saying people, the value is that people have a right to be treated with dignity and with, you know, e with equality. And the problem is that that's not happening. And the second one you're saying everybody must contribute economically or, and the problem is that that's not happening. They're very different problems. And so I think that's a really, I'm glad you raised that because sometimes what people take away from value-based messaging is everything should be positive. I would say, be clear what the vision is. And the vision in this one, in this one is pretty clear to me. It's that people can make decisions about what they want to do, put those choices into practice and live independent lives. Like the vision is there for me, but it doesn't mean don't describe what the barriers are to get to that vision, if that makes sense. Just, just a quick question. Yeah. Mm. What was the audience you had in mind? Because this is all relative. Well, it turns out it's not at all. Okay. They tried it with all sorts of different segments. So one of the things that I thought when I first was asked this question was, well, no, it would depend on the audience. Yeah. If it was an intrinsically motivated audience, they would respond to the intrinsic one. And if it was an extrinsically motivated audience, they would respond. And that is not the case. Across the board, people are more likely to undertake pro-social activity when their intrinsic values are activated. And it kind of makes sense. Because if you activate in me my extrinsic values that tell me that my achievement, my wealth, my social power are important, and then ask me to contribute to somebody else's well-being, I'm much less motivated to do so than if you activate in me what might be recessive intrinsic values and then ask me to, because they're there. And that's the beauty of this research that kind of liberated me, that I didn't have to... I don't have to talk to extrinsically motivated people in their own terms anymore because I need to have the faith and I'll come a little bit more to the evidence it's not just faith the evidence tells me that the vast majority of people do prioritize intrinsic values but just quickly what is the overall sorry I'm sorry can I just ask um, the text A mm. um, the barriers were confident in the middle so it's sort of positive and mm -hmm. No, I mean, I think that's good practice. Yeah, I think it's good practice. Start with something positive, name the barriers, and good communication should be very clear about what the barriers are. Um, and there's a whole other class we do on naming the agent that is acting, because if you don't name the agent that is causing the barrier, then your audience will have trouble understanding who might have the power to remove the barrier. But that's a whole other class. And I'm really mindful of time and where I've got so much to get through and I'm realising I thought I would get through more than I can, but I want to get to some of the really critical bits. Here's what the research tells us. When intrinsic values are consistently evoked and prioritised, we get extremely clear and consistent increase in pro-social and pro-environmental behaviour altruism, cooperation, envi pro-environmental behaviour, peacefulness, tolerance, acceptance, respect for human rights, all go up. And this goes up across a population 
if those messages are being consistently evoked. Where achievement, power and power, extrinsic values, are consistently evoked, you get more selfish behaviour, competitive, antagonistic, nationalist, homophobic, racist and something that is called hostile sexism as opposed to benevolent sexism. <laughs> um, but hostile sexism, we can probably guess what that looks like. Benevolent sexism is what you see when you evoke conformity and tradition values. So benevolent sexism is the kind of, we've got to look after the little ladies. Apparently that's benevolent. Um, where conformity and tradition values are evoked, unfortunately we don't get as much of that, we don't get that selfish competitive antagonistic for kind of obvious reasons. Conformity and tradition values tend to talk about um, really sort of not putting yourself at the centre, they are not self-interested values, but they are resistant to change values. And so they're not so helpful if we're in the business of trying to see, you know, get more inclusive and more progressive values. And probably the last point that I think has really revolutionised how I do communication and messaging, when fear is evoked, so when the security values are brought into your message, it evokes all of the same behaviours as the achievement and power. Plus, to make it worse, people lose their capacity to tolerate any kind of ambiguity or complexity. And it makes sense, right? When we are afraid, our brains go into a mode that is about finding us, you know, a survival. And that is not a mode for complex or ambiguous thinking. And so this has been uh, a really one of the greatest challenges for communicating climate change. It's very, very hard to talk about the reality of climate change without frightening people. The problem is that as soon as people are frightened, they lose, literally cognitively lose their capacity to process complex issues or to think about complex solutions. And I think this is probably at the heart of one of our biggest challenges around um, climate communications. Um, but what we know now is just let's just stop doing it. Don't frighten people. Frightening people only works if you're trying to convince them to be more nationalistic, homophobic, racist, anti-immigrant. <laughs> and I'm guessing that's not what most of us are trying to do. Yeah. I haven't seen research on that. I'd like to see the research. Often what's actually being evoked is love um, and benevolence. Um, you know, so it, like the, this is very precise work. Like the difference between evoking success and evoking self-determination. Uh, sometimes people show me a text that they think is evoking self-determination and when I look at it a bit more closely, it's definitely evoking the achievement mode, which is like capability, hard work and success. Um, often we're actually evoking love or you know sort of oneness with nature um, but I do think there's a difference between me feeling frightened for myself and my family versus me feeling terribly sad that something that I love is being harmed and that's a very different um, values uh, group of values being evoked there does that make sense yeah yeah, that's pretty good. yeah. so just very quickly um, often I asked stop here and do an interactive, like what do you think of the dominant values in New Zealand? We don't have time for that, so I'm just going to go straight to the good news, which is that the World Value Survey has been done in New Zealand, and this is using the PVQ, which is, you know, which is a, a well-validated tool. And so New Zealanders very, very strongly prioritise intrinsic values. Benevolence, universalism and self-direction. These are values that matter very much to New Zealanders. So why does it seem that people often aren't acting in accordance with those? It's because our ability to translate our values into action are affected by a whole range of contextual factors. Some of them are well beyond the scope of communications. For example, I may strongly value environmental protection and want to ride my bike, but if there is literally no way for me to safely ride a bike in my city, my actions may not reflect that belief. 
So there's a whole lot of factors that we can't shift, but one of the things that, that affects our ability to enact our values and our choices is not just are they in conflict with another more strongly held value, but are they in conflict with a value that is currently being strongly evoked for me? And what that means is if all around me there are messages that tell me that power and attractiveness and prestige and wealth are important, those values are constantly being activated in me, even if they're not the things that I personally value deep down, if you put me into a non-primed neutral space. This is what in the psychology they call priming, and it's the effect of evoking a certain set of values through words, images, all kinds of different ways we evoke it. And what it does is it pulls to the forefront a value that we may not otherwise give a lot of importance to. And understanding that explains this. This is a research in the UK where people were first given the PVQ to find out what values they prioritised. Actually, in the UK, they had a slightly lower rate of prioritisation of intrinsic values. You saw in New Zealand it was more in the 90s. In the UK, it was 74% of people prioritised intrinsic values, and only 26% prioritised extrinsic. Then they were asked a second question. Which of these values do you think other people in the United Kingdom prioritise the most? They thought that 77% of the people who did this study thought that other people in the United Kingdom, most people, m put most importance on extrinsic values. So this is what we call the perception gap. That we think that the people around us hold different values to us. And then we use that perception to guide our decisions in our communications. And so firstly, we have this misunderstanding that if we invoke extrinsic values for people who value extrinsic values, that will motivate them, and the research tells us it doesn't. Secondly, we have a misperception that we think many more people are predominantly motivated by extrinsic values than actually are. And why do we have the gap? I would say it's because they're constantly saturated with extrinsic messages, and we are not, as a sector, doing a good job of countering that because we've basically all agreed to engage in that frame and often are using extrinsic values in our messaging, and I'm not blaming anybody, I'm saying like that's just what I feel that I often was doing. It's a problem because if you think that the people around you don't share your intrinsic values, you're less likely to vote, you're less likely to participate, or to volunteer, you're less likely to engage in democratic activities. It kind of makes sense because it feels a bit pointless. You think most people don't agree with you. So the good news, to get to it, is when they did this research, they discovered that the intrinsically primed audience were more willing, or the first question is, were they willing to offer their support to the disability organisation? The intrinsically primed audience, yes, they were. The extrinsically primed, no, they were not. And I forgot to tell you, there was another group where they mixed the values into one message. Some economic values, some self-determination values. Didn't work. So the only message that produced more willingness to participate than having no prime at all was the intrinsic one, and that's across all segments of the audience. But here's where it gets really exciting. Having heard the message that you just heard about a disability organisation, were people more willing to offer support to an environmental organisation? Yes, they were. Extrinsically primed? No, they weren't. Mixed message, no they weren't. This comes from a piece of research called No Causes in Ireland, and if there's one message that I would love you all to take away, and that Jess and I would love to somehow communicate to the entire community sector of New Zealand, is that when we use intrinsic values, because of that uh, diagram I showed you earlier about how intrinsic values evoke a whole raft of pro-social and pro-environmental behaviours, when we use in intrinsic values for our cause, we are serving all pro-social and pro-environmental causes. Likewise, when we don't, when we evoke extrinsic values, we are undermining the population's willingness to support all pro-social and pro-environmental causes. And for me, this is why it's really exciting, as we did yesterday and as we are today, to talk to groups of people who might be working across different issues and see how like, we're in this together. Like We have to work together to counteract 
the like enormous over saturation of extrinsic messaging. Uh, there's another piece of research that I'm not going to go into because I think we've kind of covered it off. The key message is that people hold contradictory beliefs and complex and contradictory values. They can move between them. Our job is to toggle them into their most helpful values, the values that we know promote pro-social and pro-environmental behaviours. And the research is really clear the way we do that is by evoking those intrinsic values consistently in our messages. So, what do we think the value is that's being evoked here? The why, and one of the, I realise values is a kind of weird concept. The way I would ask it is, what does, this po what does this message tell me is the reason why we should keep people in college and not send them to prison? Because it's cheaper. The reason why is because it's cheaper. It's a really bad reason why. I really, if I, like, you know, if we could all stop making the why that we're saving money, that would be a fantastic outcome. Because the problem with this is, there's another way to make prisons cheaper, right? I mean, you just make them shittier. Like, just, you could have amount of annual cost per prisoner in Pennsylvania. You haven't evoked any of my intrinsic values. You've in fact evoked my extrinsic, self-interested values. So I'm gonna read that and think, why is it so expensive to keep a prisoner in prison for the year? Can't we just like give them shittier food or maybe just kill them or something? It's a really, really problematic frame that we use all the time. What's the reason why we would save the Maui dolphins? That's not what this is telling me. Remember, I'm persuadable. If I'm not your base, I'm persuadable. I'm not sure whether we should save the Maui dolphins or not. You're telling me here the reason why we should do it is because it won't cost very much. It's not that expensive. We should save them because it's not that expensive. This is a good message for your base, but you don't want to put it out into spaces where your base might share it with their friends and families, and you definitely don't want to put it into public spaces where you're communicating with persuadable people. Uh, this one I would call a mixed message. I think they're evoking extrinsic values that it will cost us money later if we cut them out of the budget now. That's a cost. It's clearly evoking financial values that he's going to cost us money. I also think they're evoking some intrinsic benevolence values because it's a lovely face on the little boy and I do feel that. But the evidence is if you have both of them going on, your base will flip to benevolence because they already are with you on that. Persuadables will flip to the value that is most strongly primed in their surrounding environment. And unfortunately for us, in most Western neoliberal economies, that will constantly be that money matters. So mixed messages are not good either for your persuadables. What, what's the reason why? Fear. This is, this is a fear-based message. And I'm just going to say this again because the research is very clear on this. Evoke people's fear and they see only simple solutions to complex but solvable problems. And what we know is that for many of these issues, simple solutions won't get us there. So we really, like, fear is not serving us at all. The good news is we can prime or activate these helpful values and people will become more receptive to pro-social and pro-environmental ideas. Um, this is another, Fana Ora are getting lots of props for me at the moment, but this is another headline on a story uh, about a single mother. Um, it's clearly evoking intrinsic values. It's also centering the mother as the hero, which I love. We don't get enough of that in stories about children in this country. <laughs> and we're going to finish with a video that tackles an issue that I feel like I campaigned on badly for many years. And this is what we probably should have been doing, but um, I think I'll finish with this. Oops, no. Well, this is also a great video, but I was going to play you this one. I think it's coming. <laughs> 
In Australia, Mother's Day is a day to acknowledge and give thanks to our mothers. For all they do for us, big and small, every day. For feeding us and cleaning up the messes we make. For steering us in the right direction and giving us hope. And a shoulder to cry on. A smile that's just for us. And cuddles, lots of cuddles. For loving us, no matter who we are, what we do, or where we are. For being selfless, dedicated and always there. No matter who you are or where you are in the world, these things never change. So this Mother's Day, we're thinking about another group of moms. Mothers who share all of the love and all of the pain of parenthood. But who face a challenge that most of us can't really imagine. Today we want to send a message to our fellow mums in detention centres in Australia and on Nauru. We want you to know that there are many Australians who do not support our government's inhumane policies. And we, along with thousands of others, are doing everything we can to make our voices heard. We want you to know that we won't stop fighting for your family's right to safety and security and a place to call home. So from one group of mums to another, we want to acknowledge your bravery and resilience in parenting under such difficult conditions. We wish you strength. We wish you courage. We wish you hope. And we wish you love. Please know that we're thinking about you all this Mother's Day. This Mother's Day is for you. This Mother's Day is for you. This Mother's Day is for you. So my apologies for perhaps <laughs> making people cry. Um, that is a really, to me, an extraordinarily powerful example of ev evoking intrinsic values to talk about an issue uh, without avoiding the truth of how, how you know, very, very bad things are. Um, it's a very good message in lots of other ways. It's very clear about who can make a change. Um, that it talks about who's responsible. They're not just somehow, they didn't just somehow end up on Nauru. It's really clear that the government is making that choice. Um, so there's a lot of things that I think we can learn from that video. I have another one that I'm not going to have time. So you have to come again. We'll do more. But just to run through the basics of it, people hold complex and conflicting values, but most people prioritise intrinsic values. We can use intrinsic values to switch or slide people into the most helpful frame that they hold and keep them there. Um, and I think this is sort of not something that we covered uh, a lot, but I think um, this is kind of like a teaser of where we're going to go next in our communication uh, workshops, is that all of that will sl sneak us past people's pre-existing unhelpful beliefs and values. And then we need to give people evidence that we have a strategy and a plan, that it's credible, that it's believable, that it can work. And that's kind of, I, I wanted to say that because I think it's really important that just evoking values um, without a really clear call to action won't get us where we need to go.